We are live. All right. I'm a little crazy, aren't I? All right. Is it working? All right. Keep an eye on it for me. One of you guys keep an eye on it for me. And let me know if there's any questions on YouTube. So, again, we invoke the Father of our Lord Jesus to bless the second part of my response to Zachary Hussein by filling us, filling me with the Spirit to speak truth without error, to explain the passages correctly, and to purify our motives, my motives, to do it for the praise of Jesus, not for the praise of men. That Jesus Christ will increase in all of us. Muslims get saved until every Muslim knee bows and every Muslim tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Father, sanctify me, please, and then fill us with your Holy Spirit to live your word and to love you and obey you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Okay. <clears throat> in the first part, it's quite clear Muhammad cannot be the prophet like Moses. Is that that was clear, right? He didn't speak to God directly in time and space. God did not appear to him visibly. He didn't do the miracles of Moses, and he contradicts the theology of Moses at key essential points. So, if anything, he's a false prophet whom Muhammad, who who Moses would condemn, right? <clears throat> and may the Lord Jesus loosen my tongue to speak clearly. Now, there is a way around this, though. Here's a way around it for Zakir Hussein and other Muslim polemicists. They can't admit that Muhammad is a prophet like Moses only if they admit the Quran has been corrupted. What do I mean? All those statements in the Quran, all those statements in Hadith, must have been insertions, <clears throat> corruptions made by later Muslim scribes after the death of Muhammad. Because if Muhammad is truly a prophet like Moses, then Muhammad would have never denied that his God is a spiritual father to believers. Muhammad would have never denied the necessity, the importance of having a sacrificial system, a priesthood, and an altar to offer sacrifices for the forgiveness of sin. Now, he didn't come out and deny it. So let me be clear on that. He didn't simply didn't deny it, but he didn't affirm it, and he didn't continue it, right? Muhammad would not have allowed a divorced woman to remarry, consummate that second marriage, before she can return to her former husband. He would not allow it because it's an abomination. And Muhammad would have never taught to kiss a stone when he knows that that's condemned by the true God of Moses. So you can say that all of these things were added to the Quran, to the Hadith, so that wicked, dishonest, deceptive <clears throat> Muslim scribes change the message of Muhammad to contradict the message of Moses. So you can opt for that if you want. All right. Well, if that's the case, then you really can't tell me what Muhammad taught or believed because it's been corrupted. Therefore, toss out the Quran, reject Islam, and embrace Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now, let's discuss the comforter. Lord willing, I'm going to cover two aspects. First, I'm going to show how those very passages that Zakir Hussain quoted to prove the comforter is, only, is Muhammad, not the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, anoint me to glorify you, speaking clearly, is going to backfire against him because it's going to prove too much. And you guys heard it last night when I responded to Hamza Yusuf. But again, we're creatures of repetition. We need to hear something over and over again until by the grace of God's spirit, it becomes second nature so that we can then use it. And by the way, that's the point of these sessions. I don't want to be the only one using these arguments. Like Jerry, Jerry Thomas, who found these materials and used it to glorify Christ in India, you need to study these materials and use it in your witness. Use it in your debates with Muslims. Use it in your evangelism. Use it to teach other Christians. Start a Bible study and apologetics group in your church. Use it. That's for you. This is God's wisdom given to us freely. Use it. Right? Please, take these videos. Take my articles. Take it. It's not mine. It's a, the gift of God's grace to build up the church and strengthen the church and their witness to see Muslims get saved. So use it for the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to show how this backfires against Zechar Hussein in proving that the Father and Son are Muhammad's God. And then I'm going to explain why is it the Holy Spirit can only speak by what he hears, by what he's told. Does that deny the deity of the Holy Spirit? Or is that a gross misunderstanding of what the Bible teaches concerning the relationship of the persons of the Godhead? So Lord willing, I'm going to cover both those aspects. Let's start with the first aspect. How do these passages prove too much and end up refuting Islam? Remember, Zechariah Hussain quoted John 14, 16. Let's look at John 14, 16. Let's do this again. I did it in my response to Emza Yusuf, but it's worth repeating because this is a nightmare, folks. It's a nightmare. It's going to prove too much. 
He quotes this, but doesn't see the implication of this. And I will pray the Father. Doesn't say I will pray to Allah or God. I will pray the Father. And he, the Father, shall give you another comforter. That he may abide with you forever. All right. Now let's read 17. Watch this, guys. I love these passages. Because they, they glorify the triune God. Now 17. Even the spirit of truth from the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. Now, hold on. Muhammad was a visible human being, and he was seen by his contemporaries, both by friends and foes. But whoever the spirit of truth is, he cannot be seen by the world because being a spirit, he's invisible to human eyes. Now, as a spirit, he can manifest visibly, but he's not going to manifest visibly to the unbelieving world. But Muhammad was manifest to unbelievers and believers alike. So right there, if you just read 17, it cannot be Muhammad. But then the Lord Jesus says something else. To the disciples, to Peter, James, and John, and Thomas, all of them. But ye, you know him. How do you know him? For he dwelleth with you. Wait, 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 wait. The spirit of truth, the comforter, was already dwelling with the apostles and shall be in you. And then eventually he's going to indwell you like he's indwelling me. He's going to work in and through you, empowering you to carry out my work when I leave physically to return to the Father. That's what Jesus is saying here. How can this be Muhammad? Are you telling me Muhammad was dwelling with the apostles at the time of Christ? Really? Is that what you want me to believe? Really? I mean, honestly, ask the Muslim, answer the question, and be sincere. Don't lie. Are you saying Muhammad was dwelling with them at the time of Jesus, 600 years before his birth? I mean, right there, you can just stop and say, you know what? Don't waste my time. I don't want to hear anything you have to say. Because if you're going to butcher my scriptures to this extent, you're not worth my time and you're not worthy of any respect. To manhandle the word of God in this way, you are not worthy of my time and you're not worthy of any respect. You're actually... One of the dogs and swine that Jesus mentions in Matthew 7, 6. Sorry, I don't mean to be harsh, but I'm being biblical. Matthew 7, 6, our Lord says, Do not give what is sacred to the dogs or cast pearl, pearls before swine, because they'll trample them underfoot. Right? But anyway, let's still uh, assume it's speaking of, speaking of Muhammad. Remember, I pray the Father. John 14, 26. John 14, 26. What does it say? I pray the Father, right? I'm going to pray the Father. He's going to give you another comforter, someone like me. Elon Parakliton. Someone of the same kind. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. Let's forget that here we're told he is the Holy Ghost. And all the Greek manuscripts are uniform in that it's the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Let's forget that. Let's forget that according to Zechariah Hussein's theology, the Holy Spirit is Gabriel. So if anything, this is a prophecy of Gabriel. Which means that if he's going to be consistent, he's going to have to argue that Muhammad is the incarnation of Gabriel. That Gabriel became flesh and his name is Muhammad. But let's forget that. Let's put that aside. Let's put that aside. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So notice who the Comfort is. Besides him being the Holy Ghost, he's the one that the Father sends in the name of Jesus Christ. For the sake of Jesus Christ, on behalf of Jesus Christ, because he requested it. Okay, now, here's my question for you. For Muhammad to be the comforter, that means he must have been sent by the Father of Jesus Christ, on behalf of Christ, for the sake of Christ. But hold on, let's look at chapter 9 of the Quran, verse 30. Chapter 9, verse 30. Let's see. Is God the Father of Jesus our Lord? According to chapter 9, verse 30. Let's see. And the Jews say Ezra or Uzair is the son of Allah. And the Christians, Nasara, say the Messiah is the son of Allah. Well, yeah. Allah being an Arabic word for God, we should say Al Messiah Ibn Allah, Habib Allah, right? That is their saying with their mouths. They imitate the saying of those who disbelieve the bold. Allah Himself fighteth against them. He will fight you, damn you, kill you at the hands of Muslims. If you don't repent or pay jizya for saying that Jesus the Messiah is the son of Allah and Ezra is his son. How perverse are they? Okay, now I'm really confused. 
John 14 says, it's the Father that sends the Comforter on behalf of Christ, for the sake of Christ, in the name of Christ. The Quran says, Jesus is not the Son of Allah, the Son of God. How then can he be the Comforter? Can someone explain that to me? How then can he be the Comforter? Okay, now, if just Quran will be honest enough to answer questions and not get into debate, because I don't want to dot or bounce him, he's going to help me make my case. Just Quran, because you only follow the Quran. Let me ask you a question. Is it true according to the Quran, Allah sent Muhammad? Allah sent Muhammad, right? For those of you listening on YouTube, we have a Muslim guest. Hopefully, he'll be respectful enough to answer questions in the text. Allah sent Muhammad, right? Which one am I see? Salam. Okay, my friend. Did Allah send Muhammad? I don't have too much time. Hopefully, you'll answer correctly or I'm going to have to ignore you. Allah sent Muhammad, right? Let's see. Let's see how long he takes to answer a question. I don't have much time because this is being live streamed. I want it recorded. All right? Okay, let's see. I'm going to give him 20 seconds to answer, then I'm going to have to send him on his merry way. Did Allah send Muhammad? All right. Yeah, he's too scared. Yeah, no, he's, he's just too scared. He just, you know, they're afraid to defend their religion. I don't blame them. Would you? Would you want to debate it, defend it? All right. Wasting time here. Anyway, if you ask, if you ask the Muslims, they'll say, Allah sent Muhammad, right? In the name of Allah, to glorify Allah, to proclaim the praises and the glory of Allah. They'll tell you that. All right, good. Allah sent Muhammad. Muhammad came in the name of Allah to glorify Allah, to proclaim his glory. All right. John 15, 26. John 15, 26. Let's see. But when the Comforter is come, whom I, Jesus speaking, will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Wait, 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 wait. Here now we're told Jesus Christ sends the Comforter from the Father's presence. Two things. Do Muslims want us to believe that Muhammad proceeded from the Father in heaven before he was born on earth so that Muhammad existed in heaven? Now, uh, amazingly, you have Sufis, Muslims, who are into mystical Islam, that actually believe that Muhammad was there with Allah as light, that Allah created Muhammad as light and eventually sent him into the world. So you know what? They may say, yeah, wow. So I'm setting myself up with that one. But even if we go with their interpretation, that the light of Muhammad is nur pre-existed. It says that this comfort is coming from the Father. But Muhammad's God is not a father. So how could he come from the Father? And how could Jesus send Muhammad? When according to the Quran, it is Allah who sends Muhammad in the name of Allah to glorify Allah. But here the Lord Jesus says, I with the Father together will send the comforter from the Father in my name to glorify me. John 16, 7. John 16, 7. John 16, 7. We're almost done with this part because I went more in-depth last night. Then we're going to talk about the intra-Trinitarian relationships. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come. Unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. Wow. Father and Son, Jesus Christ, both send the Comforter to Jesus' followers. And when the Comforter comes, this is what he's going to proclaim. John 16, 14 and 15. John 16, 14 and 15. I hope I'm not putting you guys to sleep with this. I know you heard this last night, but we got to cover it again. John 16, 14 and 15. He, the Comforter, shall glorify me. For he shall receive a mind and shall show it unto you. He's going to show you the things that belong to me. Now, what belongs to the Son? Verse 15. All things that the Father hath are mine. Everything that the Father owns, Jesus owns. They're mine. Therefore said I that he shall take a mind and shall show it unto you. The Holy Spirit's role, the Comforter's role, is to convince people that Jesus is the Son of the Father, who is the heir to the Father, who owns everything that belongs to the Father. That's one of the things he convinces people of. Now, you Christians here, you're convinced of it. You know this. 
you have no doubt Jesus is the unique beloved Son of God who is one with the Father in glory, honor, and majesty, and who owns everything that belongs to the Father. Because the Comforter was sent to you to bear witness to your hearts and souls, convincing you of this truth. So you all believe it. But wait, does Zechariah saying believe that Jesus is the Son who owns everything that the Father owns? And if the son owns everything, that means he owns Zakir Hussein. He owns all Muslims, all peoples, all lands, all creation. Because all creation belongs to the Father. And yet 1615, Jesus says, all things that the Father has are mine. Is there something that the Father doesn't possess in creation? Is there something in reality in creation that doesn't belong to the Father? Of course not. Everything belongs to him. But Jesus says, everything that belongs to the Father belongs to me. They're mine. That means Muhammad belongs to Jesus. He's under the feet of Jesus. All the Muslims belong to Jesus. All humanity belongs to Jesus. All angels belong to Jesus. All creation, the trees, the plants, the sea, everything that exists belongs to the Son because he is the heir to the Father, one with him, and owns everything that his Father owns. Did you catch it? Does Zachary Hussein really believe that? Does he really believe that Jesus owns everything that belongs to the Father? So that he really believes that Jesus owns Muhammad, owns Zakir Hussein, owns Zakir Hussein's mother and father, owns Zakir Hussein's property, owns Zakir Hussein's cars, his homes, you name it. He owns it all. The Muslim lands belong to Jesus. All the resources belong to Jesus. Everything. Gabriel belongs to Jesus. Michael belongs to Does he really believe that? So he wants to use these passages to convince us that Muhammad is a comforter, comforter. When the Quran says Jesus is not the Son of God, and the Quran doesn't say that everything that Allah owns, Jesus owns, he really wants to convince us of that, right? So now let's bring out the logical conclusion, the implications of Zakir Hussein's shameless butchering of God's word. If the comforter is Muhammad, then the Father and the Son are Muhammad's God, Zakir Hussein's God, Allah Almighty. Why? Because Allah sent Muhammad. These passages, it's the Father and the Son who sent Muhammad. And yet, these passages, if referring to Muhammad, means that the Father and the Son are Allah, the God of Muhammad. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't have your cake and eat it too. If you're going to say these passages are Muhammad, well, these passages say father and son together are sending Muhammad from the father's presence in the name of the son to glorify the son by convincing people that everything the father owns belongs to the son. So it's Muhammad. Well, thank you, Zakir Hussain. And thank you, Hamza Yusuf. Thank both of you and all the Muslims who argue like you for now proving that Allah of the Quran is the father and the son. The God of Muhammad who sent Muhammad in the name of the son to bear witness that Jesus the Son owns everything that the Father owns. Alhamdul Masih. Alhamdul Ab wal Ibn. Al Masihu Akbar. Al Yasu Akbar. Thank you. Praise the Lord Jesus. You see the problem with this argument now, guys? You, you understand the argument, right? You, if you understand it, they'll never quote these passages against you ever again. If you understand the argument, Comfort is Muhammad. Jesus says, I will send them from the Father. The Father will send him on my behalf, in my name, to glorify me. Yet, if that's Muhammad, and Allah sent Muhammad to glorify Allah in the name of Allah, hmm, Allah is the Father and the Son. This again then proves, this again then proves, here, no sight, thank the Lord he's here, he's going he's gonna to help me prove this point. Okay. This again then proves that the Muslims corrupted the Quran, changed the message of Muhammad, because Muhammad would have never denied that Jesus is his God, Allah Almighty, and that Jesus and the Father together are the one God, Allah, Father and Son being his God, his creator, his maker. He would never have denied it. Never. Because he's the comforter, right? Okay. Now, no side. Please help me by answering questions in the text. Please, friend. Don't drag it. Don't delay it. Just uh, uh, answer honestly. According to the Quran, Allah sent Muhammad, right? He sent Muhammad to proclaim the glory of Allah. And he came in the name of Allah, right? Like, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. In the name of Allah, right? You agree, right? You agree? No side is a Muslim. Hopefully he'll answer honestly. Okay, good. He said yes. Guys, we're doing YouTube. You can't see it. He said yes. Now, Zakir Hussein and Hamza Yusuf said that the comforter 
is Muhammad. Okay, now here, let me show you something, Mosai. John 16, 7, for the benefit of our Muslim friend. Hopefully the Lord will save him for his glory. John 16, 7, watch this. Watch here. Pay attention, no sight. Jesus speaking, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto, unto you. Now watch this, no sight. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. I, Jesus, send the comforter unto you. John 15, 26. Help me, no sight. I'm not saying become a Christian, but answer honestly for the fear of God. John 15, 26. But when the comfort has come, whom I, Jesus speaking in, will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth, comes out of the Father, he shall testify me. Now, according to these passages, no sign, Father and Son together will send the comforter from the Father himself. Now, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? And that God is the Father. Do you believe that? Okay, he said, no, I don't. Good. You're honest. Beautiful. So then how can the comforter be Muhammad when Jesus just said, the Father and I, the Son, will send the comforter? If Muhammad is a comforter, then that means you are now admitting that the Father and the Son, Jesus, are Allah, Muhammad's God, because you just said Allah sent Muhammad, but here the Father and the Son are sending the Comforter, whom you Muslims want to make Muhammad. How do you escape the fact that your argument now proves that the Father and the Son, Jesus, are your God and Muhammad's God, Allah Almighty? How do you escape it now? You want to stop using these passages? Yeah. I will send from the Father. So did Muhammad come from Jesus' Father? Did Jesus send him? So you don't do the tap dance. Now you're going to... Now you're going to expose your true nature. Did Muhammad come from the Father by Jesus sending him? Do you believe Jesus sent Muhammad from God the Father? Yes or no? Do you believe Jesus? Okay, end of story. Stop the nonsense and be honest. He just said no. So if the Father and the Son are sending the Comforter, then if Muhammad is the Comforter, then start worshiping the Father and Jesus as your God Allah. When are you going to get baptized and be a Christian? Because Jesus is your the God of your prophet Muhammad. Okay? Now, one more thing for you, no side. John 16, 14 and 15. I respect when you answer honestly. John 16, 14 and 15. Watch this. Okay, watch here. John 16, 14 and 15. Jesus speaking of the comfort again. He shall glorify me. The comfort will glorify me. How? Well, before you ask, answer mine, and I'll answer yours. For he shall glorify me. For he shall receive a mine and shall show unto you. Now watch this in verse 15. No sight. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show, you, show it unto you. Pay attention, no sight, to what Jesus said. Everything that the Father has belongs to Jesus. Now, does the Father own? Well, you don't believe that he's the Father. Does Allah own everything? Does he possess all creation? Is all creation his? No side. You just admit that Jesus is your owner, your master, your Lord. Because notice what 15 said. All things that the Father has are mine. Everything that God owns belongs to Jesus. Does Allah own Muhammad? Does Allah own Muhammad? Does he own him? No side. Time is running out. No, it's okay. You don't need to accept it as infallible. Your Muslim scholars quoted this to prove it's Muhammad. So you're stuck with it, friend. Now you just admit Allah owns Muhammad. But Jesus said, whatever God owns, I own. You just admit Jesus owns your prophet. Your prophet belongs to Jesus. He's under Jesus' feet. Thank you. Now can you now email Hamza Yusuf and Zach Hussein and say, stop embarrassing us Muslims. Can you stop using these arguments for the love of God? Because you're now helping Christians to prove that Jesus is Muhammad's God, owner, and judge. Can you stop? Please? Before you ask me a question, do you agree you guys need to stop quoting these verses to show that Jesus predicted Muhammad? Yes and no? Yes or no? Before you ask a question, 
and go into La La Land off a, on tangent? Do you agree? Stop using these. It doesn't matter your bias. Why are you quoting verses that backfire against you? Can you stop? You agree? Yeah, that's wrong. We should be quoting these verses because, yeah, in the context, it's the Father sending the Comforter in Jesus' name, and Jesus is sending him with the Father, which means the Father and the Son together send the Comforter, which means that if it's Muhammad, then the Father and Son are Allah, Muhammad's God. All right, good. At least he's honest. Praise the Lord. Yeah, and we use whatever agrees with the Bible. So if your Quran agrees with the Bible, we use it. Yes, thank you. At least you're honest. Now, what's your question? If it's ready to the topic, I'll take it. Good. So you saw, guys, with your own eyes, how these arguments work. They're battle-tested by the grace of God. They're irrefutable. I'm telling you, they are. Are you seeing it? They can't respond to you honestly. They can't. So glory to Jesus that he's made Christianity irrefutable because Christ is risen. He's alive. No one can dethrone King Jesus. Praise his only name. What's your What's your question? If it's a ready topic, I'll answer it or I may defer it later. Let's see. Because now I need to go into the intra-Trinitarian relationships. No side, if you can ask your question quickly in the text. Oh, that's the uh, That question, I answered that yesterday. Okay, let me answer it for the sake of no side. John 16, 7 says that the comforter will not come if Jesus doesn't leave. So you're assuming the comforter wasn't there, right? Because of John 16, 7? He wasn't there? How can it be the Holy Spirit? Well, no, that means you haven't read the Bible. Who told you that Jesus meant to say the comforter wasn't there in any sense? Let's go back to John 14, 16 to 17. Let me now explain to you what Jesus meant that he has to go for the comforter to be present. And yes, it is the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit was present. But now let's look at John 14, 16 to 17. Okay, now read with me, no side. This is what happens when you trust your Muslim apologist and don't read it for yourself. Watch this, no side. John 14, 16 to 17. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Now notice no side, verse 17. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. No side. Did unbelievers see Muhammad, as well as believers? Did they see him physically, visibly, when he was alive? Did they see him? <clears throat> You got to answer quickly so I can move to answering your question. And I want to stay okay. Did unbelievers and believers see Muhammad? Did they see him physically? Don't go silent on me, friend. And King, King of Sky, do you want me to bounce you, friend? I don't know why you're answering. Do you want me to you want to get bounced? Okay, they saw him. Well, here it says, the spirit of truth the world cannot see. Unbelievers will not see him. Thank you for proving it's not Muhammad. That's number one. No, that's not what it says. Don't twist the scripture to your shame. Then I'm going to expose you as a liar that you're dishonest. It didn't say they won't see his truth. They will not see him. Stop this satanic perversion of scripture because that exposes the spirit that controls you. John 8, 44. Your father's the devil who's a liar and a murderer. Stop. Be a man and fear God and speak the truth. Your perversion of scripture is disgusting. Okay. John 14, 17. One more time. Let's read it. So that's that can't be Muhammad, but it gets worse for you. John 14, 17. One more time. Read with me, no side. Because the world does not see him, neither knoweth him. But ye... Can you wait and get, first answer your first question? Can you wait? Or are you not getting scared and doing the tap dance, which is typical of you Muslims? Read the text, no side. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you. Did you ever read that verse? Jesus says to the disciples, the Spirit of truth, the Comforter, dwells with you. Was Muhammad there with Peter, James, and John? Post John 14, 17 again. John 14, 17 again. But it says the Comforter was there with the disciples. So who told you the Comforter wasn't there? You're misunderstanding Jesus' words in John 16, 7. Right here, John 14, 17, the Comforter, Spirit of Truth, he dwells with you and shall be in you. Bam, right there, no side. The Comforter, who's the Holy Spirit, was there with the disciples, but he wasn't in them. 
He wasn't in them. That's why Jesus says, when I go, then the Comforter who is with you shall be in you. In you. So where did you get that the Holy Spirit, because he was there, can't be the Comforter because Jesus says the Comforter wasn't there? That's perverting my scripture. Jesus did not say the Comforter wasn't there. He just said in John 4, 14, 17, the Comforter is with you, disciples. Are you saying Muhammad was there with them 600 years before he was born? His point is, I have to go for him to be in you. Because as long as Christ is on earth, the Spirit wouldn't be in them, in all of them. Which again shows it cannot be Muhammad, unless you believe you can fit Muhammad into your body. So you cut yourself open here, Muhammad, let me put you inside my chest. Exactly. He was with them, but will be in them. In them. So that's why Jesus says, I have to go. When I go, then the Comforter will come to live in you. But he's already with you because he's in me. So glory to Jesus. May you see the truth and repent and accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. So praise the Lord. Okay, guys, you see how easy it is to refute the objections of Muslims if you know your faith? No, he's not running king of the sky. Calm down, buddy. Calm down. Dude, King Zion, what's wrong with you, dude? Are you, like, mentally challenged or disturbed, friend? You can't stop chiming? Guys, you see how many, how much times this guy is disrespecting me and not just respected the rules? What should I do to this guy? Bounce or dot? One for a dot, two for a bounce. How many ones? All right. King of the sky, this time, this time I'm going to dot you. You act up again, I'm going to bounce you. All right? Not you, no sight. Are you king king of the sky? Hopefully not. King of the sky, if you come to my room and disrespect my wishes, I'm going to bounce you and ban you from the room because you cannot behave yourself and you're a Christian. Shame on you. Control your emotions. Right? Anyway. Lord Jesus, have mercy and forgive us. Lord, strengthen us. <clears throat> In Jesus name. Okay. Did everyone see these arguments being used in actual apologetic situation and why they can't refute it you see they can't refute it now does that now strengthen your confidence in using these arguments for the glory of Christ right this is not my information knowledge this is the knowledge that comes from the Holy Spirit for the body of Christ use it pass it on and share it now that we've refuted the fact that the comforter is Muhammad God forbid such blasphemy. The Comforter is the Holy Spirit, and Muhammad is under the feet of the Spirit, the Son, and the Father, the one God. Now let's talk about why is it, if it's the Holy Spirit, did Jesus say the Holy Spirit will not speak on his own initiative? John 16, 13. Now are you ready for that part? Because once I answer this, I'll be done with Zachary Hussein. Lord willing, I may be able to do another topic on something else, either Christology of the Quran Part 3 or something else. We'll see afterwards. Okay, now, let's go to John 16, 13. This will help you understand what the Bible teaches about the Trinity. John 16, 13. Okay, watch this. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. It doesn't say authority. It says, up out to, from himself, right? But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Now notice the objection by Zachary Hussain. How can the Holy Spirit be God, right, if he will not speak on his own initiative of himself, on his own authority, but will be told what to say? Who tells God what to say? Does anyone tell God what to say? Now, this is what we call, begging the question, circular reasoning. Because number one, it assumes that God is a single person. Yes, if you have a single person in the Godhead, then of course no one can tell that person what to do and what to say, right? If God is a singular person, right? So he's already assuming what he's yet to prove, that God is unipersonal. Are you with me there? It is true that God, if he's a singular person, and there are no other divine members within the Godhead, then no one can tell that God what to do, what to say. But who told you that God is a singular person? And how do you know what a multi-personal God would be like? In other words, if God is not a singular person, 
But if God exists as three eternal relationships, then how do you know how the three relationships would interact with one another? Are you God to know how they would function? Of course not. God has to tell you what it's like for a multi-personal God to be like. You with me there? If God is multi-personal, then yes, you can have distinct persons who are inseparable from one another, dependent on one another, that obey one another. Because the members of the Godhead are not separate beings with conflicting, opposing wills, conflicting, opposing thoughts, where they get into a conflict and argue with one another. That's not the Godhead. According to Scripture, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they are inseparably, immutably, perfectly united with one another and therefore can never, ever act separately, independently. Can never do it. So the Son can only act in union with the Father and the Spirit. The Spirit can only act in union with the Father and the Son. Likewise, the Father only acts in union with the Son and the Spirit because they're inseparable. They're in perfect harmony, loving one another perfectly, immutably, cannot argue, cannot have a conflict, cannot fight with one another. Impossible. That's impossible. Cannot happen. So this is a gross misunderstanding and distortion of the biblical teaching of the Trinity. Yes, the Son cannot act independently from the Father any more than the Father can act independently from the Son, any more than the Spirit can act independently from the Father and the Son. They always and only and immutably act in perfect union, inseparably so. So John 16, 13 is not a denial of the deity of the Holy Spirit. It's actually an affirmation of their perfect, inseparable unity. Are you with me there? So you Trinitarians have to know what you believe about the Trinity. The Bible doesn't teach there are three separate beings with three separate conflicting wills, three separate conf conflicting minds. They are three inseparable eternal relationships that work together inseparably as one and never act independently or argue with one another. And so the one seeks the will and desire of the others. That's how they work, in perfect, inseparable union. Is that, is that clear? Because I'm going to prove it scripturally. I'm going to prove it scripturally, but I first have to explain what it means for God to be tripersonal, for there to be a tripersonal God, a multi-personal God. Is that clear to everyone, or did I put you guys to sleep because there's no feedback? i got to make sure you got this because now I'm going to prove it from Scripture. You understand what we are, we're supposed to believe if we're Trinitarian? Father, Son, Holy Spirit are three eternal relationships that are immutably one, inseparably one, cannot act in the, independently, cannot argue with one another. There is no conflict among them. Impossible because they're perfect. Is that clear? Renee and everyone else, is that clear? I thought Renee was here, I guess, but like. You understand that light? Now, to prove my point, to prove my point, I'm going to show you Jesus using the same language in a context that shows that Jesus is claiming to be God. Same thing that Jesus said about the Spirit in John 16, 13. He says of himself in John 5, 19. So let, let's prove my case scripturally. Let me show you from the Bible that, yes, if you have a multi-personal being, a multi-personal God, then yes, we would expect to find that no person of that Godhead would act on his own initiative, act independently and separately from the others, but would only do and act in perfect accord with the others. So this shows that Zechariah is saying either does not know the Trinity or is dishonest and deceptive. I'll let you decide. Let's go to John 5.19 to prove my point. John 5.19 to prove my point. John 5, 19, to prove my point. Let's find the truth posted. Watch here. Same language that answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself. Same language. The Spirit does not speak of himself on his own initiative. But what he seeth the Father do, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Now, if you don't read this carefully, you're going to lose the point. Here Jesus claims to be God Almighty, one with the Father. How does he claim that? Notice what he says. The Son of God cannot do a single thing on his own initiative. The only thing he can do is what he sees the Father doing. 
whatever the father does the son does likewise now show me a creature claiming that he can only do what god does nothing more nothing less and whatever god does he does likewise what creature can say these words what creature can say these words so is jesus denying he is god or denying that he is a renegade a lone wolf distinct being who can act contrary to the father in opposition to the father what is jesus saying here is he denying his deity or is he affirming his essential equality with the father and his inseparable union with him the son can do nothing of himself every creature knows that they do a lot of things right contrary to the father the son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the father do i do a lot of things that the father would not do would never do and hates me doing it a lot of things and i cannot do only what god does what the father does because i don't have the ability that the father does to do those things here is a clear affirmation that Christ is God Almighty because it's only God who can do the things that the Father does. And he also affirms his inseparable union with the Father. Is that clear? Light and everyone else, are you understanding that this passage, along with John 16, 13, speaks to the perfect inseparable union of the members of the Godhead and speaks to their essential equality because for them to do what they do, they have to be God. All right, let's continue to prove that point. Let me continue to show you from that very chapter. Let's now look at 20 to 21. Let's break it down. 20 to 21. And Della, I'm going to need you to quote the Quran in a minute. 20 to 21. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. Whatever the Father does, he shows the Son. Look, Son, look what I'm doing. Do the same. And he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. Now notice, to prove my point that Jesus does things that only God can do, because he does whatever the Father does, and what the Father does are things that only God can do. Notice 21. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, gives them life, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. Does that sound like a finite creature? Or does that sound like the Almighty, Eternal Son, who is fully God in essence, one with the Father in essence, yet inseparable from him, can only act in perfect union with him? What does that sound like right here? Just like the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he wills. Is that clear, guys? The son gives life in the same way the father does. Wow. And yet this is supposedly proof that Jesus isn't God and the Spirit isn't God. Now, John 5, 22, 23. Watch here. John 5, 22, 23. For the ju Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Why? Why does the Father want the Son to judge everyone and determine their eternal destiny? That all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Now understand this. Jesus didn't say that God the Father wants you to honor me like your parents. Honor me like a prophet. God the Father demands that everyone honors me the same way they honor the Father. This again shows that he's no creature, because if he is, that's blasphemy. Why? You are to honor God by loving him unconditionally, loving him more than anything, even your own life, and be willing to die for him. You are to love God by praying to him, by singing to him, right? <clears throat> by carrying out his will. This is a kind of love. An honor that you cannot give to a creature. I cannot love a creature unconditionally and love him just as much as I love God. I cannot sing praises to a creature. I cannot pray to a creature, worship a creature. That is the honor that I can only give to God. But Jesus says, that's how the Father wants you to honor me. The Father wants you to honor me the way you honor him. So if you love the Father unconditionally, you love me unconditionally. If you love the Father more than your own life and are willing to die for him, you have to love me more than your own life and die for me. If you pray to the Father, you need to pray to me. If you sing to the Father, you need to sing to me. In any manner, in any way that you honor the Father, you have to give me that same honor. Does that sound like a creature? Does that sound like Jesus thinks he's a creature? 
Now let me prove to you that Jesus is claiming that you have to love him perfectly, unconditionally, more than anything, more than your life. Love him just as much as you love the Father. Let me prove that to you. Matthew 10, 37 to 39. Matthew 10, 37, 39. Matthew 10, 37, 39. Watch here. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Here you go. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Sure sounds like Jesus saying you have to love him unconditionally more than anything, more than your own life. Right? Matthew 10, 37, 39. Matthew 16. Matthew 16. <clears throat> Let's read 24 to 27. Matthew 16, 24 to 27. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Matthew 16, 24, 27. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. You have to love Jesus more than the world, more than anything in the world, more than your own life, and be willing to give it up for him. Does that sound like Jesus thinks that he's a mere creature? That you're so, supposed to give honor to the way you honor other creatures? Or is he claiming that you need to love him perfectly, unconditionally, love him as much as you love God? What does this sound like? Can you tell me what it sounds like? Come on, guys. The recording's going. Don't be scared to respond. I'm here for you, and I need your feedback. What does this sound like? Wow. So when Jesus says, the Father wants you to honor the Son as you honor the Father, could it be any clearer that Jesus is claiming to be equal to the Father in glory, in honor, in majesty, in worship, in essence, nature, ability? And yet, at the same time, Christ cannot act independently from the Father. All right. What about praying to the Son? We honor God the Father by praying to Him. Should we pray to the Son? John 14, 12 to 14. John 14, 12 to 14. Oh, Blight, this is blessing you and everyone else. I hope it's a blessing. I hope you didn't go to sleep on me because you're eating lunch or you're tired. John 14, 12 to 14. Okay. Verily, verily, I send to you. Notice what the Lord says here. He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Notice what he's saying. You're going to be doing the same works I've been doing, but a greater number of them. And here's why. I'm going to the Father. Okay, so you go to the Father. How does that result in the disciples doing greater works than you've been doing? 13 and 14. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. See, once I go to the Father, you'll be asking in my name to do these works, and I will be the one doing the works through you. What kind of attributes must Christ have to be able to answer all prayers and do the very things that all these people are asking him to do, no matter how many they happen to be, no matter where they happen to, to be at? What kind of attributes? He must be omniscient, right? Because he must know who's praying to him, right? And he must be omnipotent, right? He must then be powerful enough to answer these prayers. So here Jesus is saying, I'm the object of prayer. You pray to me the way you pray to the Father. I will answer your prayers the way the Father answers your prayers. And you are to love me unconditionally the way you love the Father unconditionally. Love me more than your own life. That sure sounds like Jesus is claiming to be God and worthy of the same honor that God receives and deserves. Is that clear thus far? Is that clear? Let's go back to John 5. Let's now pick it up. Read 24. You know what? Let's skip 24. Here's what I want you to do. John 5. You got to do it this in this order. John 5, 25 to 26, and 28 to 29. 
John 5, 25, 26, 20, 29. Verily, verily, I send to you. Notice what our Lord says. The hour is coming. Pay attention here. And now is the hour. Pay attention. Hour now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. So you're going to hear God's voice? Yes. But which person of God? God the Son. The dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and when they hear it, they'll be made spiritually alive. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. So the Father is the source of life, and the Son is the source of life, because he's one with the Father. And because both Father and Son are the source of life, they are able to give life to all creation. No creature can say, I have life in myself the way the Father has life in himself. But Jesus says that. And because Jesus has life in himself, he doesn't need any creature. He's independent of all creation, one with the Father and the Spirit. And because he has life in himself, by the sound of his majestic voice, his voice is so powerful that at the sound of his voice, people come to life spiritually and physically. How do I know physically? John 5, 28, 29. Pay attention to this, guys. Marvel not at this. For the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves, that's physical, shall hear his voice. Whose voice? 25 tells you. Hear the voice of the Son of God. Those in their graves will hear the voice of the Son of God and shall come forth. Wow! How majestic, how glorious, how amazing is the sound of the Son of God's voice. Just by his sound, he gives life spiritually and physically to the dead. And at that hour, the last hour, the day of judgment, it's his voice that will bring the bodies, all those bodies that have decayed, decomposed, back to life. In order to stand before him in judgment, just by the sound of his glorious voice. What kind of power is Jesus claiming to possess that just at the sound of his majestic voice, he can speak spiritual life to spiritually dead people and reconstruct, reconstitute physical bodies that have disintegrated at the last day? What kind of power must he possess? Come on, guys, help me out. Got a power. I guess I put you to sleep. Hardly anyone's commenting now. He has to be all powerful. Only the voice of God contains that power to give light spiritually and physically to those who are dead. All power. Uh, sorry, scam. They can't tell you that. That they cannot tell you that because Allah does not give any prophet. The power to give life because that's one of his exclusive attributes. That's a lie. Now, no Muslim will say that. None. In fact, I'm going to prove it to you. You ask the Muslim on the last day, the last hour, day of judgment, who's going to raise the dead to life? Bring them out of their graves. They'll tell you Allah. Will Allah use any creature? They'll say, Stuck for Allah, that's blasphemy. But now watch chapter 22, verses 6 to 7 of the Quran. Guys, pay attention. Jesus said, at the last hour, at that hour, he, by his sovereign voice, the Son of God's voice, will bring out the dead from their graves, their tombs. But now let's read chapter 22, verse 6 to 7. Chapter 22, verse 6 to 7. Find the truth. After he posts chapter 22 of the Quran, verses 6 to 7, what I want you to do is post John 5, 25, 28, and 29. Right after he finishes posting verses 6 to 7 of 22. Now post for me, find the truth. John 5, verse 25 and 28, 29. Guys, let's read this. Tell me who Jesus is claiming to be in light of the Quran itself. Watch. Read with me, five karm. Watch here. Watch what the Quran says Allah will do. 22, 6 to 7. That is because Allah, he is the truth. And because he quickeneth the dead. He quickeneth the dead. Who quickeneth the dead? Who gives life to the dead? Allah, because he's the truth. And because he is able to do all things. And because the hour will come, there is no doubt thereof. And because Allah will raise those who are in the graves. So Allah's the truth. He quickeneth the dead, gives life to the dead. And then the last hour, Allah will raise the dead from their tombs, their graves. But wait, John 5, 25 and 28, 29 again. Verily, verily, I send to you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. 
the hour's coming. It's the Son of God's voice that will give spiritual life to the dead as well as physical life because in 28, 29, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, the voice of the Son of God, and they shall come forth. Wait, 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 wait. The Quran says, the Quran says that last hour it is Allah who quickeneth the dead and will raise them from their graves. Jesus said that hour is the hour in which I, the Son of God, by my voice, will quicken the dead and bring them out of their graves. And you're telling me Jesus is not claiming to be God? Is that what you're telling me? But Jesus didn't simply say that it is his voice that will bring the dead out of their graves at that hour. He also claims to be the truth and the life. Go to John 14, 6. John 14, 6. I'm almost done with this part of the rebuttal. What's the time on the live stream? Have I passed the hour mark? John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. The truth and the life. Wait, wait, wait. The Quran says Allah's the truth. Jesus says, I am the truth and I'm also the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Wait, Jesus is the truth and the life. John 5 21. Jesus quickeneth the dead, quickeneth, gives life to whom he wants. John 5 25, 28, 29. Jesus says, The dead will hear his voice, the voice of the Son of God, and come out of their tombs at that hour. All of which the Quran says Allah will do. All of which the Quran says Allah will do. Why is Jesus claiming to do the very things that the Quran says only God Almighty does? Can you help me understand that? Why is the Son of God claiming to do the things that even the Quran says only God Almighty can do? But there's more. John 6, 39 to 40 and 44. John 6, 39 to 40 and 44. John 6, 39 to 40, 6, 39 to 40, and 44. There's more. And this is the Father's will, which has sent me, that all of which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. Now watch this. But should raise it up again at the last day. Jesus says, at the last day, the day of judgment, I will raise up, resurrect believers, raise them physically, and glorify them. Now notice verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up, raise him up at the last day. I will raise him up at the last day. Sorry, I accidentally talked to you guys. I will raise him up at the last day. Did you catch it? The last day, the last hour, the Quran says, Allah, Allah alone, will raise the dead from their graves and quicken them, giving them life. Jesus says, at that hour, at the last day, I, the Son of God, will raise up all believers, raise them all up, right? And at the sound of my voice, the dead will come to life. Who does Jesus think he is? No man come can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Is it clear, guys? That Jesus is speaking and claiming to do the things that even the Quran acknowledges only God Almighty can do? Is it clear? Is it clear? He's claiming to be God Almighty by doing the things that only God Almighty can do. And at the same time, he's not the Father. He's the Son of the Father, which is why we're Trinitarians. Is that clear? For the rest of you who went asleep on me. Man, it's like I lost all of you. I don't know what happened. Is it clear? Because I'm about to wrap this up. By the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's now look at John 5, 19. John 5, 19. Because I'm going to wrap this rebuttal up. John 5, 19. John 5, 30. And 16, 13. Now, let's look at it in context again. John 5, 19. 5, 30, 16, and 13. Now, let's see. In light of what we just read. When Jesus says that neither here nor the Spirit will do anything on their own initiative. Are they denying that they are God or they're claiming that because the one God exists as three eternal relationships, these relationships are inseparable from one another, right? They never act independently from one another because they can only act in perfect union. Now let's read it. John 5, 19. 
Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I said to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. If you stop there, seems like he's denying to be God. Let's finish it. But what he seeth the Father, I can only do what the Father does. That's it. No creature can say that he only does what God does because creatures do a lot of things that God would never do and no creature can do the things that God does. Right? For what things soever he the Father doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. I do what he does in the same way. John 5.30 I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Now John 16, 13, about the Holy Spirit. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. In the context of John, in the context of the Bible as a whole, how could anyone take these verses, twist them, to teach something they were not meant to teach. When Jesus and the Spirit, when our Lord Jesus says of himself in the Spirit, that they do not do a single thing on their own initiative, but they only do what they hear and are commanded. This is not a denial of their deity. It's an affirmation that the members of the Godhead are immutably, unchangeably, inseparably united. They do not act independently. They do not have a conflict of will. They do not argue with one another. They don't debate each other. They don't fight with each other. Impossible. Because as the one God, they are immutably, perfectly united, inseparable from one another, and can only work in perfect union with one another. That's what our Lord Jesus is saying. How is this a denial of the Trinity and the deity of the Holy Spirit? God is not unipersonal. A tripersonal God, a God that's multipersonal, a God who exists as three eternal relationships, those relationships interact with one another. Their interaction is such in that they are interdependent. They cannot be separated. They cannot act independently, and there's no conflict of will, but only perfect, inseparable union and harmony and love. That's why they're one God. How does that refute the Trinity? How does this refute the Trinity? With that said, my thorough refutation of Zachar Hussein's shameless butchering of God's word is over. Remember, Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahweh to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. I pray I made no mistakes in interpreting the scriptures. If I did, may he correct it to me not to repeat it and save you from any error. And may the Lord Jesus use these videos to glorify him, glorify his mighty name, strengthening Christians and bringing Muslims to saving faith in Jesus' name. May the Lord Jesus increase in us. May we decrease. May he save us for his glory. Cover us by his precious blood. Cover our loved ones, my wife and children, under his blood. Amen. We love you, Lord Jesus.